Is it working? Okay. So hi everyone. Um, happy to have a guest talk today. We're happy to have um, our guest speaker today. We have Ting Wang, who is the director for EU Data Science and Machine Learning at Wayfair. Um, Wayfair is a company which I think most of you probably haven't bought any products from. I live in Germany, and I also have to admit I haven't bought anything from Wayfair because I didn't know much about it. But an e-commerce company. Um, Ting was formerly at Booking.com, which I am a large consumer of because I think it has the best booking platform and it's very reliable. Um, but today we're going to have a fireside chat. So Ting is just going to introduce herself briefly and where she's from. We'll go into a brief Q&A. But the goal today is really to let the trainees ask as many questions as possible um, to get to know. So you can ask your questions in terms of what Wayfair does, perhaps what Booking was doing, but also where uh, machine learning, AI, and data science are used in the industry. And welcome, Brenda. Who's, uh, yes. Hi, Brenda. Hello. Hello. You have a much beautiful, much more beautiful background than I do. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, I'm really honored to be here. Um, really nice to meet all of you. Uh, although I can't see all of you, but uh, still, I mean, from a few introductions, it's, it's a very diverse group and people coming from all, all over the place. So uh, really nice meeting you. Um, yeah, let me introduce myself a bit and maybe also touch up uh, a bit on Booking.com and Wayfair. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, ask it, either in chat or just unmute yourself. I'm more than happy to, to dive deep into the topics that you are interested in. Um, so I, I came from a academia background. So I um, studied uh, econometrics and then my PhD is around uh, market microstructure. Uh, don't worry, it's, it's a field uh, that is very niche that not so many people <laughs> know about. Uh, basically, what I study is how the um, financial mar market and mechanism works that match buyers with sellers. So I use a lot of high frequency trading data, building models to figure out what is the uh, price premium for liquidity, um, how, the, how the trading mechanism affects the uh, price discovery, the, the buyers and sellers behavior. So did a lot of empirical research um, and use a lot of statistical modeling and during my PhD. So after that, as you can imagine, I just very naturally uh, continued my career in the financial industry. So I became an algo trader. Um, to be honest, it's very similar to what data scientists do nowadays. But uh, you know, more than 10 years ago, the data scientist was not as hip as sex nowadays. And we are very uh, proud to call ourselves uh, you know, algo traders. Uh, so basically, I, I you know, I am working with high frequency trading data, building the automated trading uh, strategies. Right? So uh, how, uh, try to leverage the, the large scale of the transaction values and make uh, small margins out of it and uh, from their uh, uh, money for the, for the company. Um, what opened my eye during that experience was really working with um, developers. So my job is mostly focusing on building the models, the strategy, and I test it. Uh, and then I work with the developer to put it in, in production, right, in, in one day's term. Um, I really enjoy this collaboration. Uh, so for, the, for my next uh, step, I, I look for an like, environment where I can even um, have a more collaborative uh, setup. And that's, that's when I joined Booking.com. Uh, so as, uh, as Aaron mentioned, this is probably a more well-known brand to you. It has a very strong stance in the Europe. Um, and there I started in the storefront, like a front-end uh, product development, um, and then very quickly stepped into a leadership role for uh, building, leading, and growing the data science team. Uh, I worked in various areas at Booking, right? So I, I worked in customer-facing product development. I worked in uh, also supplier-facing, so building tools for suppliers to upload their inventory, um, is, you know, also contents, including pictures and you know, hotel descriptions. I also worked a bit in the um, customer service department, so where we started to um, build more automation using machine learning to, to, to that areas. Um, even a little bit around fraud. Um, so basically, you can think of me like you know trying to start to help you booking to build teams in different areas. Um, so after seven years working at Booking, uh, I want I want a new challenge. And what uh, attracts me uh, uh, at Wayfair is a completely different uh, industry. Um, so Wayfair, uh, as you may know, is it, selling furniture online. 
um, actually more than furniture, just furniture is everything that you need at, at home. Uh, it has a very strong brand in the US, right? So it's a top brand in the US, uh, has very strong um, uh, customer awareness there. Um, and we, we have very complex supply chain and uh, logistics uh, established in the US as well. The reason that is less known in Europe is because we only started uh, a few years ago, first entered the UK market and then a German, German market. Um, so we are still building, building our brands uh, in, in Germany. You probably see some, uh, some, some uh, Germans will see like TV advertisement, um, but it, it's relatively young, young brand in, in Europe. Um, so it, it's a it's a retail business, right? So unlike Booking.com, which mostly provide a service, um, so at Booking, you know, like uh, the, the hoteliers put their put their inventories at Booking. Booking, you can think of this as a like a bookshelf in a supermarket, right? It's it just just a platform, and then the customer comes and and book things. It doesn't own any any actual inventory. It doesn't own pricing. It doesn't have any you know complex operations, uh, which all exist at WeFair's complex, right? So at WeFair, uh, we move physical goods from suppliers to customers. Uh, we have our own warehouse. We even have our own delivery network. Um, so all of this uh, opens a lot of opportunities for machine learning to come in and, you know, help to optimize and bring efficiency to the, to the whole process. Um, so I, I head up the data science uh, EU team, uh, where a group of 35-ish uh, people. Um, it, it contains of data scientists, uh, machine learning engineers, and uh, analysts, um, product managers. Basically, a very multidisciplinary team. Um, and you probably have already learned from Brenda, right? So uh, one of the area that we cover is fraud prevention. Uh, super fascinating, also an area where machine learning has been applied in, in many different places. Um, so here, you know, we, uh, we basically build uh, algorithms that can uh, help us to reduce the false positives. Uh, I, I don't know how much Brenda has shared already about your, your work. Um, I probably want to talk a little bit uh, about the other two areas where, where we, we, uh, we work on. So one is what we call a voice of customer. Um, we basically build a whole suite of tools um, that helps to process and analyze all the customer feedbacks. And this includes text, this includes images, um, and text in different languages. So we, we have a wild range of tools that ranging from um, topic extraction to uh, sentiment analysis um, to actionability layer where, where um, uh, the business team can, can take direct insights and act upon it. Um, so we are uh, also partnering with various teams at Wayfair, like um, uh, in the merchandising or in the user, user generated content areas. Um, and yeah, so the main techniques we use there is uh, NLP um, and some image mining, yeah. A little bit of that as well. Um, so another areas that we we recently grow and we will continue to double down is uh, supply chain. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, right, Wayfair has a quite uh, complex supply chain because of its business model. Right, so we have uh, suppliers all over the world, and we we are we have having increasing more suppliers from from Asia, uh, which you know. Uh, involves like freight network to to ship things from from Asia to like uh, North America or Europe. We also have our building our own warehouse and fulfillment centers. Um, we have our own network, which means we have its own trucks and drivers, right? That that uh, transport things from different places, and all of this um, builds up a very complex uh, network and supply chain, um, and. In, in the past, Wayfair has, bu has been building systems and processes to, to help optimizing this, but there were very little uh, data science in that. Right? So all the, all the key decision-making engine is built on top of um, business rules, uh, just to simplify it a bit. Um, and we are entering this space, want to transform how we do trans supply chain uh, using machine learning. Uh, so ex examples that we do are 
uh, we use machine learning to improve the accuracy of the customer promise. So if you come to any of the e-commerce website, right, you, 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 you want to know the, the, the goods that you, you buy, when this will be delivered to your doorstep. Um, and, and behind this can be business rules, can be algorithms. Um, so we are basically trying to uh, predict this using, using machine learning. Uh, we are also doing projects around uh, estimating the uh, what we call like a dirty cost of uh, uh, of the the, the uh, total cost. Um, you, you can imagine, right? If you if you buy something, um, it's not only just you know a, a carrier uh, send this to your home. Uh, you may you may find things got lost. You may want to return things. Uh, you may want to contact our customer service because you have certain issues. All of these are the probabilistic components of, uh, of cost um, that we want to estimate and uh, optimally choose a carrier and supplier based on the total cost rather than only the deterministic part. Um, so these are the two examples that we, uh, we use machine learning in the supply chain area, but I'm more than happy to dive deeper into, into uh, either of this or, or in other areas if you have questions. Um, I think I, I, yeah, this probably is a, is, is a, is a, that's like super, no. from my side. <laughs> no, that's, that's a really nice overview. So, I mean, I'm just going to start asking questions. Yeah, well, I'm sure you have better questions, but I'm going to, uh, go first. So I saw in your tech blog that you generate 20 terabytes of data per day. Um, so how do you, how do you keep up with that speed and that flow of information? How do you build systems? You mentioned 35 people. Can you describe what that process looks like? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this is a, this is a great question. I think this is also um, probably one thing that uh, many you know uh, fresh graduates who are you know aspire to work in the data science uh, field didn't appreciate that much before they truly work in a commercial uh, setup. Right. So the the, the skill and the the magnitude uh, that that. Uh, big companies are facing. Um, so indeed, right, Wayfair, Wayfair is like a $10 billion uh, dollar business. So it has a lot of customers every day. A lot of people come into our website, place orders, and then you know it, it, the orders go through the complex supply chain I just mentioned, right? And then, uh, yeah, it, it delivered, and maybe a customer has issues, so they call up customer service, where the, the phone calls or the the emails are being 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 tracked, so all of this contributes to the the huge data that we are uh, having in at, at Wayfair, and um, this this I would say is even a challenge uh, for for Wayfair as a whole. Right, so Brenda Brenda can can add to it because she's uh, she feels the pain I think uh, uh, quite quite concretely. Uh, it's it's difficult to really get your house clean for this amount of data. Uh, what a typical like tech, tech team do is um, you have the software engineering team that controls the source of the data. Right? So you, you have teams that are building applications. Uh, let's let's uh, think of like customer facing applications for a moment to simplify things a bit, right? So maybe take a fraud as example. So if, if we build application that will filter transactions where, where we, we think is high risk or low risk, right? You, you, when, when you build that, you start to log uh, customers' reaction to that. You, you log the funnel, how, how, how people go through that. So that the software engineering team checks and controls the source data. And then this source data, right, in some format, uh, in Wayfair's context, is still mostly a SQL database, was stored somewhere, right, in the, in the, in the database. We are moving to uh, cloud uh, uh, technology, so many of these are copied into the the, the, the cloud uh, data lake, and then um, different teams build things on top of it, right? So it's not only used by data science team; it's also used by analytics team, used by business team. So many teams start to build aggregations and build build reports on top of it. So what you will typically see is. Uh, Companies at Wayfair scale, right? They have different internal infrastructures to help streamlining this process. So, so the, the product team should have a quite clear responsibility how they would generate data, how they monitor from the source 
whether you know the, the expect data are being generated and then there's infrastructure to hold that data right make replications and making sure you know this this is uh, updated um at, at the, at the, uh, in, in the right way and then uh, there is infrastructure that helps teams to build aggregations and, and build this on top of it. What I want to mention uh, quite specific for data scientists is um, our needs are usually not being fully covered by uh, the infrastructure because uh, uh, the data scientists are much more agile. Right? So they, they don't only work with aggregated data. Sometimes you need to go to the, the raw data right, to, to find the event logging. You need to Go, basically, you, 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 you go through a wide spectrum to find what data you need. Um, and this, these needs are usually not covered. So very often, uh, as a data scientist, right, you've probably heard this or read it from blog, a lot of time I spend on um, yeah, data mounting and, and feature engineering. Right? So because of these various like, data sources and different granularity, usually data scientists need to is to do many of this work themselves. What we what we try to do um, in, in our team is we um, also add other capabilities to help the scientists speed up this process. Right? So in our team, as I mentioned, we have machine learning engineers. They they help building building certain pipelines to to uh, 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 produce and generate feature in a more efficient way. We have central infrastructure team that build some tools for data scientists specific, right? Like a feature store, uh, a typical typical uh, uh, tool you will find. Um, and uh, we have analytics team that usually set up monitoring or dashboard for for data qualities and some of the reporting. Um, so all in all, I, I think for data science, it, it's a it's a it's a typical challenge that you have to go through different data sources, very different granularity. Um, and, and the best way is you could, you, you, you are also surrounded by um, other, other roles and um, be supported by the central infrastructure team so that well, this process is much more effective. I, I started to see questions popping up, um, but I, I, yeah. I, Brenda, uh, do you want to add anything? I think. No, I think you. Yeah, it was a very good answer. So, um, in the meantime, you can answer Blaze first, but I will just ask it as well. Yeah. Um, so, given you know it's a continuous process of onboarding young people and some others leaving, or even it could be seniors. But what is the type of like, for example, for a junior person joining um, the company? The complexity is large, like from every side, from data engineering, as you said, from even the software development to actually then the consumption uh, by the respective team, it could be the CEOs, the decision makers. So what are the, type, the typical structures that you saw relevant or like you guys use to onboard and from your experience, which type of, you know, people with which type of those people, okay, I'm gonna, so what type of skills were helping juniors to adapt quickly? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so maybe, maybe before I jumped into this question specifically, let, let me share my, my view about the, the evolution of like data scientists over time. I, I think what well, you probably have seen, seen the similar, um, thinking other, other ways, but I, I just want to tell my, my booking experience and the Wayfair experience. Um, so if you, if you look at like 10 years ago, or like maybe even, even earlier than that, um, I think at that time, data science is just booming, right? So it's like, we have several breakthroughs in, in the academic research, and you know, a lot of them are being used or leveraged in the commercial setting. Also, the commercial companies start to, you know, gathering much more data. So it, it has a scale that starts to leverage data scientists. So you see this, this field in general, like, you know, uh, very active and, and, and booming. And what you typically find is uh, the data scientists start with a generalist team. What I mean by that is, um, you know, the, the first 
data scientist uh, in the company usually is a unicorn, right? It, it is a person that may has a specific background, like uh, maybe this person is, is more stronger in the model development, uh, but then very soon he or she will need to find, he, he needs basically they need to do everything, right? So they started to learn, you know, uh, how to wrangle in with different database. They start to, uh, you know, like be, be more prof prof proficient in, in coding. They start to talk to business people, right? Uh, educating them <laughs> what data science means, what, what are the models they're building, what this could be used. So, and, and then the, 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 the teams they are building usually is of similar profile. Like you find people come with certain strengths, but they, they grow into a, a generalist. And the team in general is, is a generalist team. Um, and over time, right, as, as the, the co companies are getting more mature, is, especially if you are looking at like a media or large scale companies, they started to have a build data science org and it, it spawns off like many different teams. It started to place this in different areas in the company. And then uh, also the, the engineering team are more used to working with data scientists and you start to find the teams um, become more specialized. Um, so what I mean is you usually find a team, right, of, of people that focus more on the algorithm part of the, of the work, right? So they, they come with very strong, like, you know, modeling mindset, they, they very scientific background. They are very good at, you know, going in depth into the algorithm and trying to build on that. And then you find people that are typically coming from software engineering background, right? So, so very good at software engineering. They start to build like, you know, more, more, sophisticated, more sophisticated applications. And you find people that are typical, like very strong on the commercial sense, right? So they, they are very good at translating business problem to, to um, uh, uh, analytic problem or data science problems. So, and, and usually a team is, is of different peoples and each plays their role uh, and, and each becomes more specialized in their role. And if you look around today, right, uh, companies like Wayfair or Booking or any large companies, you would find a lot of different titles. And that's typically a sign that well, the teams has already come to a specialized team. And if you, if you, if you look at like, smaller scale like startups or, or scale ups um you, you still typically find a generalist team right so they they call them uh, data scientists and you basically find your main responsibility once you are you are in the team and it's not very very clear uh, defined um so why, why i mentioned that right it, it, it's because you, uh, if if you are thinking of you know coming to uh coming to companies like like uh, wayfair then usually um it depends a lot on which specific role you 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 are aiming at right so if it's um data scientists then the, the main the main responsibility is around the model building right the, the whole life cycle of how the how the model will be built um but if you come uh, looking for roles more like um uh, machine learning engineers which in at Wayfair's definition is more focusing on the deployment, productionization, and maintaining of the, the services, machine learning services, then uh, it, it's, it's more towards like a software engineering role rather than data scientist. Um, but, you know, in a, in, a, in a smaller company, this may be very, uh, very different. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not... I, Thanks, I, I think that, that, that addresses um, my point. I think that's great to keep that overview. So, but there are some questions in the text, so maybe yeah. you could look into them. And yeah, let's let's go through them a bit. Uh, I saw quite some quite some questions around data. Um, so, one question is around like how how long do we retain the data, uh, which is uh, which is a, a <laughs> very interesting very interesting question. Um, so right now we have a retention policy um, and it, it's, it's different um, depending on which domain you are looking at. But typically like well, it, it's no longer the case that data will be retained forever. I mean, by the way, which is the case five years ago, right? Like if you, if you, if you ask me this question five years ago, I will tell you it's always there. Why, why, why not, right? It's, <laughs> um, it, but, but nowadays I think the company do, um, do have certain policies 
the, the main decision making is always around um, what is the value the older data will bring us. And I think this will get, you know, if you ask different parts of the business, it will give you very different answers. Um, so for example, like right for, for business people, especially for reporting purpose, um, year, year on year comparison is so common that requires you at least two years data, right? But it doesn't require you on, on the super granular level, uh, level. Like you can, you can aggregate it to a certain way and you can, you can keep it there. For, for data scientists, right? You, you would very well debate whether three years ago the, the behavior will give you any, any useful patterns that you, 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 you want to leverage for, for your today's prediction. Um, and, and I think, well, typically we don't go that long. And even if we want to have last year's pattern, we probably use some proxy at a higher aggregation level rather than uh, you know the the events data, which is like you know the all the all the uh, all the customers touch points and logins and the behaviors you want to log that, so that that won't be retained uh, that long. Um, I, I I was I think there there may be interesting shift uh, in the future as well. Right now we have cloud technology um, that you know data can be stored in a much more flexible way and also can be um, stored in, 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 in much more cost effective way uh, may, may spark the companies to come up with new policies. Um, I, I don't think this is a static thing. I think well, as the technology uh, evolves, we may, we may be able to store data for a much longer period, um, but the, the extraction of the data will be a new challenge, right? How, how can you fastly extract old data that is stored in a different uh, format and be able to use that, or yeah, I think I think that that will be something uh, probably the company will need, need to need to look upon quite soon. I hope I I, I address your question, uh, bless. Uh, if not, let me know. Um, I think the next one. Uh, yes, you did. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool, cool. So the next question is uh, with uh, ever involving business fields, requirements and customer behavior, do you still use data uh, 10 years ago? I, I think I, I addressed this. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, cool. Let's go to the next one. So how do you decide which user data is important to store or discard? Uh, and can data story analyzing get overwhelming uh, when there is too much data? Uh, I think for the for the for the latter question, the answer is easy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's it's definitely overwhelming. Um, and for the first question, um, so how I, I I will talk about you know what is uh, the the reality, right? What is in the in in the typical e-commerce company, and I I would also tell what in my view would be more ideal. I think what, what is the reality is um, the data scientist uh, nowadays mostly has um, not too much say about what data needs to be stored or what data needs to be checked. It's usually coming from the decision of the software engineering team. So again, the team that um, owns certain domain, builds certain applications and controls the source data. It is usually that, that team um, logs and checks data taking their needs as the primary source right so if, if i'm a team that works on the uh, search result page at wayfair right? so i i need to know how people interact with different ranking of, of the of that page i need to uh, understand how people use filters so i may I, I will put tracking and logging of that but does that team think very proactively how this will be used by other team? Not so much, <laughs> right? Um, so, but, but, but usually because they, they, they use it for their own purpose, they have certain data that has a lot, and this is uh, good enough for a data scientist to start their, their uh, project, right? So if a data scientist wants to build a, a ranking uh, algorithms, um, they, will, they will look at, okay, what, is, what, what exists today? And they will you know, go through the, the painful feature engineering process, and they will build their first version, right? Usually the MVP version of the model using the existing data. 
And, and if that proves to be, you know, impactful, then what usually happens is they, you know, build a case and they work with the, the software engineering team to say, oh, you know, maybe I think that feature could work. Can you help me to log it? Right? Then, then the teams will, will debate on this, they will prioritize this, and then certain new feature will be uh, stored. So th this, is, this is usually what happens in the, in, in the, in the company. Uh, so you, 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 there's already a lot of data that is logged, not necessarily keeping the data science needs in, 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 in mind, but they are good enough for you to start uh, building uh, MVP version of the model. Um, what I think would be more ideal, and this is also where uh, I think gradually Wayfair is transitioning towards, and we are also pushing towards, is by building a much closer tie with the software engineering team that the end user, like the user, like data scientist, can have a much bigger say about what should be tracked and what should be logged in the early stage, right? So if, if data scientists, you know, starting to build this, they can already think of, oh, you know, what could be the possible, uh, you know, useful features that I want to leverage. And, and if they have, um, if they are part of the same team, right, if, if they are, uh, aiming towards the same goal, and, and if this is shared with the engineering team, then usually it's much easier for the engineering team to pick up the, the request from the data scientist and start to, to log it and, and track it, rather than this happens at very later stage, and sometimes it takes several sprints for them to prioritize. Um, I think this is, this is actually what we, the model we have at fraud team that Brenda is, is working, uh, working in. Um, Brenda, maybe you want to share a bit how, how you exactly work with the, <laughs> with the fraud team. I think it's, it's a great example of how we change, like, you know, from being very reactive, right, only, only be able to use what is feasible to being in the part of the discussion about what could be tracked. So be more proactive in, in suggesting uh, and get get that logs for for the for the data science team. Yeah, in the fraud team, we started gathering the data that uh, we needed to identify, for example, which decisions were incorrect about fraud. But as we started generating our own data, then all the teams are using this now um, to, let's say, to propose extensions on, on this, on how can customer service agents use this, et cetera, and so on. Yeah. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, I, I, so let me, let me know, Tor, Torin, whether this is, uh, this is good. Um, other than yeah, that, thank you, thank you. All oh, good, all oh, good. So there's a question around, um, what is the optimal way to keep up with the, the new tools that is happening in this space? Uh, this, is, this is a great, great question. Uh, Brenda probably will <laughs> have a much better, much better answer than, than I do. Um, so I, I think what it, my observation for this group, right, like the typical like data scientist group is, uh, is, is very, curious group like uh, people that, that take on this role uh, take on this career path are usually genuinely curious to learn um, and I, I observed that for various people we recruited and also team that I built um, so there's always high appetite to to learn new things um, what what I my perspective is um, you, you could learn a tool the best when you can actually use it um, so not in a not in a very abstract way, but a very close to what is needed, and this is also what we encourage, like the the team, right? So when we start to explore certain things, there should be a very clear goal behind it, right? It, it's not only for the sake of uh, um, you know having a new tool, a new new toy in your in your tool set, right? This is also there. There's certain goal you want to leverage that tool to for, right? So for example, like um, we, we have been very successful to uh, exploring using ML flows to track uh, to, to check the parameter tuning right at, 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 at in our team um, but it came with a very um, concrete 
needs, right, from the data scientists. Like before MLflow, mostly the, the parameter tuning tracking is happens in the in the manual fashion in the G sheet, um, which proven to be very um, uh, you know uh, very error prone and and very very cumbersome process. Um, and and when there's tools in the market that you know you provide this uh, much efficient way, uh, it, it's very very natural, right, to to try to explore that. And and because you have very concrete goal, you can use it in the in your day to day life, right? You don't have to wait uh, <laughs> for something to happen to use that. You you, you can you can bake it in into your day to day uh, work very very easily. And because of this. Uh, it's very easy to assess whether it is indeed match your your original goal or not, and because of this, we also like you know two was promoted to other other teams and eventually uh, adopted by the central infrastructure team to have it more integrated into our um, platform. Um, so, I, I yeah I think this is a general principle, maybe, maybe not so concrete, but. Uh, have a very concrete um, business goal that you, you have. Right? What do you want to achieve uh, to this? Does it solve any pain points that you currently uh, made? Um, and, and see whether this can be coupled with your with your day-to-day um, uh, -day work. Yeah, I'll just add there that indeed, as you said, it is very, it's expected that a lot of people in the team will be just curious and will explore things on their own. But it's not because there is a, you know, a new tool that will allow you to do some cool thing that came up. It, it's, that, that doesn't mean it can immediately adopt that or you should adopt it because uh, maybe this will be unstable or maybe the documentation is not good enough. Um, so what we do sometimes is also get together as a group um, if somebody wants to propose something, then we get agreement and then someone will try it out first to do some sort of proof of concept and ask, assess how feasible that is. And if everyone agrees that that's, um, that's a good idea, then we start expanding and like teaching to other people. Um, and then from there, expanding because uh, there is a tendency also that for you to use what's already around because uh, it's much easier and faster if you carry on just using what's already available. It, there, it always costs time to adopt a new tool. So you need to prove that this will, down the line, um, solve your problem and save you time. Yeah. Yeah, very, very well. Very good points. Um, I see there are several um, questions around like skills that are needed. Um, so. Maybe I can. Um, so I, I got asked a lot by by these questions, right? Like people people that want to switch to a data science field, or um, you know, new graduates, or uh, people that want to switch roles. Um, let, let let me share share my my perspective. And if this doesn't address your question, please do do uh, do follow up, right? Um, I think that for for data scientist or data engineer, no matter like in this data field, usually the hardcore skills is what you are already prepared for. Like, you, you know, if, if you if you want to become a data scientist nowadays, right, you've got so much resources online, right? You, you get courses, you get blog posts, you get workshops, you can attend conferences. So if you if you have a solid foundation, and you have, a, you know, um, spent effort and time, and you are interested in this field. Usually, the hardcore skills, which by that I mean, like you know, building algorithms, coding, and, and statistics, modeling part. This usually you would be prepared. Um, I think often what people underestimate is more on the soft skill size um, and. This is probably the first, uh, first, like you know, uh, the, the the hitting in the reality, like you, you will face when you join the company, right? You join the company, you 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 are part of a new team, you know, everything is is exciting, and then you figure out, oh, your work is not only your work, right? You have so many other moving parts, you have so many other um, stakeholders or, or or team members that you need to collaborate, 
and, and because of that setup, all the soft skills are required, right? By this, I mean communication. Can you, can you express your, your ideas clearly? Can you get um, others' uh, uh, perspective? Can you uh, join or even lead a very healthy debate or discussion? Um, stakeholder management, right? How, how can you keep your stakeholders in the loop? How, how can you make sure they are aware why things are happening? Can you explain in a, in a more layman's fashion what what they need to know in order to understand, you know, the connection between what you are building and what they what they need, what the business objective is? All these soft skills are usually um, underrated by by people uh, afresh in this field, right? They, they they usually think, you know, I I need to I need to read this many books, I need to. <laughs> super aware of that algorithm inside out i need to you know uh level up my knowledge in this space um but these soft skills are actually quite critical when you when you join the company and when you're working in a team um so i I, th I think prepare yourself also a bit on that right so uh practice in the in a in a team setting working on the on the on the team set like projects how could you make sure uh, you know this team team playing this collaboration would go smoothly um yeah i i feel like what that is usually quite important and i i can't emphasize more like this is quite uh essential for your success in the in the commercial <laughs> commercial setting uh, in the commercial environment maybe just as a because there are many questions, maybe I can choose some of them that are slightly different so that you can answer them quickly. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so one is like on about warehouses and if you know, is there a, you know, how do you govern your data? So many has asked that question. So it could be from a security side, it could be from uh, other side. Mm -hmm. you know, how how are how is your data governed? And it would be nice as well, especially given that this week people are working on this streaming data on, and, and data breaks and snowflake kind of uh, big data handling. So if you can comment anything around that, that would be great just to probably would address that one. And yeah. maybe quickly because there are many. So just we have, I think, 15 minutes. So let's try to. <laughs> this is great. Like people, people keep, uh, keep the questions coming in. So that's, uh, that's super. Um, the data governance is a huge topic. <laughs> And and to be to be honest, I, I don't think I'm the uh, expert in this field to really talk in depth about it, um, because I, I'm 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 not in the in the data engineering field. I I don't feel like I have uh, I'm, I'm working in depth to comment on it. Um, but typically, what you find in the large uh, corporate is you have um, teams that are working on different layers. So you have teams that are building the uh, the, the source layer, like the uh, tr transforming data from, from the source data to, to certain uh, data lake. And you have teams that are building the curated data layer. So basically all the, all the data definition has been aligned, all the, all the uh, filtering, all the aggregation logic has been defined. So the, the curated data layer is built that is ready for the analytics team or data science team to directly use. And then you have uh, teams that are building like a reporting layer, uh, which then is more like a business facing. For data scientists, uh, as, as I mentioned before, you interact with different layers. But the data governance, I wouldn't say this is a solved problem even at Wayfair. Like we, <laughs> we, are, we are pretty, we are not so good at this. And it, it's in, especially in the operation areas, uh, it's still pretty messy because many of the data source not only coming from software applications it's also coming from a very manual process right so it can be read from uh, some excel sheet or some g sheet somewhere um, or like third party application somewhere and then the data data is generated so um it, it's it's pretty uh messy when when the when the source source is and then building building a common definition on top of it is is quite challenging. Um, so I think in, in the in the smaller scale companies, and when when things are built more more fresh, this is usually a better situation. 
but for for companies like uh, Wayfair still it's it's still quite uncracked uh, uh, nuts for for us i'm going to ask you two questions in one again oh, I think uh, that's one Brenda from Brenda, no i was just saying that uh, yababel is uh, muted that's all okay okay so one is about blogs and other probably i will just take the liberty to add more anything that is not directly related but on public facing ones like blogs uh, uh, that these companies including wayfair mm -hmm. what are the purposes for in a sense yeah. is it for recruiting or other elements and then i think related probably i mean it's not related but i'm just gonna relate them is and uh, michael have asked uh, about there are these different teams within the fall of like machine learning, AI, and uh, in data engineering. And how are people like different uh, people from one team to other migrate in, in what are the benchmarks uh, that, that are kind of used? Or first you could probably answer, is there such a flow? And if there is a flow, what are the kind of benchmarks? And maybe just you can address that one and I'll try to summarize the others. Um, yes, sounds good. Sounds good. So about the blogs, um, indeed, this is a typical practice you see from all the all the um, big and and medium um, companies. Um, recruitment is definitely part of the goal, right? So it's it's a great tool to build your brands to let outside uh, outside world to know what work has been done uh, in your in your company. Uh, it's a great way of sharing that. But I think more importantly, and this is also, I believe, why people at Wayfair are engaged in, in this kind of activities, is more for learning. So it, we at Wayfair uh, is very, um, it promotes a lot about learning and sharing, right? So this is the culture uh, actually I'm, I'm very proud of. Like uh, we give people the space and the environment for them to um, sponsor ideas and collaborate and learn from each other. And usually uh, a good way to summarize your learning, right, is, is to <laughs> write it down. <laughs> and, and this, you give a very concise story about what happens and what, what things has been learned. Um, and, and in this way, you know, it's also a very scalable in the sense you can, you can share internally, you can, you can make presentations out of it, you can also share externally. So I will see the main drive is, is learning and sharing. Um, and of course, this um, yeah, builds your employee brand that attracts uh, good talents from, from all over the world. And, and this, is, this, no. also, this is also the case for conference and any other uh, venues, right? So we also read others' blog and we sometimes even reach out to the authors, right? To, to discuss some, some questions in, in depth and usually you find people are very willing to share and we 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 tried others uh, approach i think some some of uh, what we have at wefair also been been uh, leveraged in, in other places um yeah so this is this is a great way of uh, uh, sharing knowledge second one is yes second and one I is on the, um, I, I, if, if i understand correctly it's basically that the, the different uh, roles in the data team right so it's how yeah. how how do people switch is, career paths? exactly is there a flow maybe just yeah. you can say if there is a flow naturally like transitions yeah. and if so, so, in so what the, the answer is definitely yes so there is a, a flow and there is people that switch roles rather in my in my team we have cases that people uh, came from software engineering roles and become data scientists we have um, uh, the other way around uh, as well, uh, not in my team, but in other teams. So it's, it's, it's quite, uh, it, it happens. Um, and in the, in, the, in the corporate, like we fear, uh, we usually have a quite defined uh, uh, career framework in the sense, you know, it, it's what we call like a competency framework, right? It lists out what uh, is the main responsibilities um, and accountabilities for certain roles. And usually, if people are aspired to, to go into another role, um, the, the team or, or the managers will help to create an environment where this person can take on tasks from another role, uh, ideally in the same team setup, so that while this person can be put into 
uh, tasks where the new competency could be evaluated. And uh, well, at Wayfair, usually it's a, it's a quite formal performance evaluation process that sees whether this person is performing for the for the new role, and then the uh, transition will will happen. Um, but yeah, so the, the the bigger company also creates opportunities in the sense you know there are different uh, always like new positions being opened up, right? There's always uh, uh, almost like always short of people <laughs> to work on things. So if if people want to want to stretch or they they are aspire to take a new role, there usually are opportunities um, to to take on new tasks, new different tasks um, in in a more proximate way, so that well, they can uh, they can start to practice the new skills and. Uh, also get a sense like what what the new role like we, we also in my team we also have people that switch from data scientist to uh, uh, data science pm um, product manager role which is a, a, a quite big shift right so here we also help the person to find a good mentor that is not just you know meeting every two weeks it's really mentoring on the day-to-day -day basis meaning that well the mentor will invite the mentee to the you know the the, uh, the stand up, the, the, the daily activities of, of their team, and will also involve the person into the brainstorming or like, you know, strategy creating sessions. So the, the mentee, the person who, who wants to go to the PM role can be really immersed into, into the new role. Um, and this is usually, you know, very, uh, I would say easier to find in the big corporate, right? Because you have bigger team, you have different teams. Um, yeah, so, so such environment uh, is, is created to help the people to switch the role. Great, thank you. So Deborah, Jakinda, and Toyin, they have asked um, related questions you already answered. Uh, is there a skill, like what kind of skill or a kind of data? So I'll skip that one, but uh, because you, it's already actually discussed more. And then there is one which I want you to answer it only at the end, uh, related to by Milky related to like you know in the absence of uh, many of like in, in europe and in the us probably there are a lot of companies a lot of data that are kind of rich in this context but in the areas in, in countries where this is not the case mm -hmm. you know what are and how can one overcome and kind of start their own business it could be and um so yeah what, what is needed or kind of any advice so probably you can address that one but then there is a thing by Stacey that I, I think would be great to, uh, if you address, again, it's in my understanding, it's related to what is the future, or at least the immediate future, but more of like, is there a persisting need that you have been experiencing in your daily jobs? It could be like as a real team, you know, your as a whole team, or particularly the team that you're managing um, that you feel will drive conversation in the near future. Maybe that's just something you could address and yeah, there are others related to the ML ops, like what other systems to use. If you want, you can comment on them. And yeah, um, I, I saw I saw Brenda already commented on that. Yeah, let great. let me uh, first try to address um, uh, Milky's Milky's question. Right, the, the question is around you know when when there is not a, when there is sparse data, how to how to deal with this. Um, so my, my answer may, may, may sound a little bit vague and, and high level, but I, I hope you get you get the, the message. Whether it's too big, too much data or too less data, I don't think that's that's really the, the key point. I think the key point is really what do you try to solve? Uh, what problem do you try to solve using the data? It, so instead of you know looking at data first and say, oh, we have this much data, how can we make sense out of it? And what, what can we extract from this, what kind of model we can build on top of this, or, oh, we don't have that many data, maybe we are not, a lot, we, we are not able to build this model or that model. It, the better way is to start asking the business question. Right? So what, what is the business problem that we are trying to solve here? Um, and really trying to get to the bottom of that. Right? So ask, ask three words before you, you think you understand it. So really get into the, to the bottom of it and then work out what is feasible to build and what is not. Maybe, maybe yes, you have very few data, but maybe your solution doesn't need uh, that much data 
uh, as the first step, right? So this is typical, you know, for the for the POC, for the MVP, you, you, you need to validate some of the key hypotheses for your key business question, right? So you have to you have to start with the business problem, and then you need to figure out what is the key, key hypothesis? What are the assumptions you already made there? And then try to build things that can help you quickly validate this hypothesis and then go from there. Um, if, if, if you go from the other way around, uh, then, then usually you are choosing things that you may think would be making sense, but in the end, uh, it doesn't create business value. And I think this is, what a, a commercial environment um, keep asking for, right? So, if you if you works in a in a in a company like Wayfair, uh, yeah, the probably the first task you you will be given, you you want to know why, and and you not only want to know why I'm using this data, you also want to know why I'm even building this. Like, what is this for? <laughs> what 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 is the change that this will bring into? And if you ask in that way, I think that the data problem will, yeah, you will very naturally come to the answer. Um, I, <laughs> I don't know whether whether this this actually is address your 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 problem, Milky. Okay. Um, so maybe just then, I think the others we can, I think given we don't have time, but if you want to comment about persisting need that you have and managing teams you know how do you efficiently manage teams we can close with that even if there are other questions but at least uh, they can be they are at least in somehow touched but maybe this too uh, could be something you could conclude yeah. with yeah. unless you have extra time Ting. feel yes. free i mean we're, we're here <laughs> I, I do i do i mean like this is my my last meeting of the day so i do have a, a bit extra time right in that case just yeah maybe the, yeah exactly answer those Questions and follow up with the ones that are below. Yeah. So the uh, the question from Stashi, right? So what what is the the need I'm observing in the daily job? Um, again, I mean this can be quite broad, and I, I probably can talk like uh, <laughs> many minutes around this. Uh, I think that the concept I, I I really like a lot, and I think this is also uh, probably the trend that we were observing. I talk about generalist and, and specialist, and it's nice to then talk about the T-SHIP uh, skill set. Um, what you, I don't know whether you have heard that, but the T-SHIP is usually you have a wide range of um, knowledge or exposure, and you have one or two specific areas where you go really deep. I think this type of um, uh, talent, this can, this, composition of skill set is what is valued more and more uh, in, in, the, in the companies. Why is the case is, right, think, think, think of what I'm talking about this, you know, shifting to the specialized team. Yes, you have a multidisciplinary team that all works together, but in order to really facilitate this collaboration, it's very important people uh, know what other roles is about, right? They don't need to be a super good uh, uh, so, uh, uh, machinery engineer and data scientist and analyst and PM at the same time, but it will be super helpful if they know a little bit about each of these fields and know their languages, know their basics, so that when you work in a team, you can really complement each other and really work as a as a highly performing team. So, so this this T ship is what I see that will you know becoming appreciated more and more in the in the commercial setting. Um, that you have you have a breadth, but then pick one or two domains which you truly are passionate about, right? And then be able to go go in depth into that. And, and this, by the way, this is what a, a tip, like in a company like this, we call an individual contributor role, right? So you, you aspire to be uh, someone that is uh, working more on the technical side of projects rather than people management. Um, but very similar philosophy, right? When, when you want to become a manager, because of more and more teams having this setup, uh, it also requires the manager to know other fields quite well. So that while you can collaborate with uh, different roles in, in a very efficient way, you can manage 
the expectations from different roles. So I think, yeah, this, this T-shape concept helps me a lot. Uh, and I see that more and more uh, prominent in the, in the, in the companies. Uh, it, can, it can help you as well, right? To, to think of, do you, you can start either way, right? You can, you can start to broaden your breast, so the, 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 this part of the T, or you can start to become a special uh, specialist in one specific field. It doesn't really matter which, which order you do, but it, it probably will help you better than just having one of it. Like only breasts or only depths is not what um, uh, appreciate the most in, in, in today's uh, environment. Um, so that, that would be the advice I would give to, to this group. Like think of this as a long-term goal and figure out your, your path to gain this, uh, um, this T-shape kind of uh, skill sets. <laughs> Yeah, great. I mean, that's actually something that uh, a lot of people also on the top, I remember uh, Google um, CEOs, I don't know which one, I, I forgot the name, but again, saying exactly similar. I, I, did, I didn't hear the T-shape, but it's actually quite good to, um, to capture it as T-shape and hopefully people can remember it much better. I think this, like, currently is the wider exposure is quite valued and having a few that is deep and I think that's really great um, and then there's on team management like what are what is your strategy with managing teams given that you have been you know managing teams for long now within different companies yeah yeah oh <laughs> this is a, this is another I uh, big, big topics um, yeah I, I can I can talk like different aspects of uh, managing teams. Um, may, maybe a very interesting perspective, which I, I got asked a lot is um, how sh should I should I try to become a manager? Uh, when do I know I, I, I should I should even try uh, on the management path? Um, and maybe just give uh, an advice from from my own experience and my, my own uh, perspective. Um, so you know, in the in the very traditional company, um, usually the the corporate letters uh, looks like you know you start as a uh, individual contributor, right? As a as a person that works on works in a team. As you become senior, you very naturally becomes the leader uh, in the in the, in the team, and then you start to manage people. And then uh, the more senior you are. The, the bigger is your team <laughs> and, and then the bigger span of control you will have. That's what typical like a traditional company has. But what you usually observe in the modern tech company uh, is very different, right? So first you would uh, observe that there's individual contributor paths and the management paths. And a typical tech company would value both of them equally. What I mean is, you can you can have you can find uh, individual contributor that has managed no people the same level as I uh, at Wayfair. They they are they are the same same level. They they uh, they have the same level of influence. Like they were invited to very important meetings, given their their inputs. Um, their pay is very similar. So usually tech companies nowadays value both. Right. So you can you can become a really successful and um, senior person just as an individual contributor. Um, when you want to become a manager, I think this is also uh, what, what is happening at, at Wayfair, like the uh, little shift, is you don't want to try to do this too early. Um, my, my, my experience and what I've uh, done even myself and I've seen many uh, of my team members have go through similar process is you really want to sharpen your technical uh, skills to a level that you, you, you know um, it, it's, it's, it's at a satisfying level. Um, the, the main reason is because as, as, long, as soon as you uh, take a management role, no matter how hard you try, you will get further away from the day-to-day. -day. 
you don't don't i mean if you think you can you can still spend the same time and spend the same effort on the technical part is an illusion or you are not doing a good job as a manager because it's a very different role it, it's just a different role you, you shouldn't think of this as uh, add on you shouldn't think this this as oh i'm doing my my individual contributor role and then i start to manage uh, maybe one or two people and then i start to manage more people no it, it you you need in order to become a good manager, you need to completely shift your mindset because the, the, the biggest change is instead of having things controlled and executed by yourself, now you need to um, have impact through others. You can't do it yourself anymore. You need to lean on your team to deliver that impact. And this is a very different mechanism than when you do it yourself. And you, you have so much, so much things you need to learn when you want to get onto that. And you can only do a good job as manager when you spend enough time to learn on, on this, uh, this new mindset and new ways of working. So if you do it too early, you will lose the chance to really get um, your technical skills at a good enough time that you know for the, for the, good enough near future, you don't need, uh, you don't need to spend more time to catch up. If you see what I mean, like if, if you do it too early, you will have a gap. You, you will thought I will still have time to, to, to close that gap, but no, that gap will, will stay there probably even widen because you don't have time on this. Um, and that, that will give your future development on the managers, a big, big hole that you have to carry and you, you probably very difficult to close. So my advice, like, especially at your early stage of your career, right, you need to think manager as a totally different role um, and don't get to this too early. Make sure you have learned good enough for, the, for your core role and you, you feel confident that you can, um, you can, you can start to you know, grow others on, on the role before you switch to the management path. I think I think that's really a good point in the sense that it is always the struggle and the underestimation of especially technical people of management and I think it's always uh, like that and and then there's uh, another question uh, given that you say that you have time so I'm just going to continue but uh, Sibitenda found really um, that having mentorship and the possibilities of that it's good to know so that uh, you know that they can they can increase their confidence and they don't have to think right now they have to have everything uh, before joining i think they that's a really good advice but a good information at least to have and michael um, i asked the question have you faced the data and analysis if so how did you do deal with it it could just be you know in any other team uh, at wayfair mm -hmm. like or uh, before so yeah. what are what are the situations yeah <laughs> of course um this is inevitable um and this should be this should be cherished right so if, if we come to the the essence of of a work of data scientists it's all about experimenting uh, and and as 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 soon as you as long as you want to build something new you will have failures and you will have dead ends. Uh, it is so common. Uh, it maybe happens at different scales, right? So sometimes, you know, you, you, you have dead end at a very early stage and, and you know, you, you will find bypass, you will find different, different uh, um, solutions. Uh, sometimes, you know, the whole idea is completely proven to be wrong. And then you have to drop this whole work stream and you have to pivot and come to a new, uh, new ideas and um, this is very common and actually I think the best culture um, is to encourage this kind of uh, trying new things and not be afraid of failure and I think well everyone uh, I mean we all should have this spirit as well um, it's yeah it's so common, right? I, I, I don't think I need to, I need to talk about this. Like if all the scientists, right? <laughs> you will have many failures in their life. Uh, we, we, we are, we are not, no exception of this. You, 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 it's very difficult to tell beforehand 
whether your model will be successful, whether it will perform the same as you expect. But this is exactly why the modern uh, software development as a whole is on this like uh, fast iteration, quick learning and quick um, uh, um, uh, quick moving, right? So, so, so that's the reason, right? You, you don't want, we are moving away from this waterfall kind of software development because the, the chance of the failure at the end is so large, right? After one year of passing things done and you figure out, oh, actually the customer doesn't want it. So now like all the modern uh, companies are doing it in the agile way, which means you build something uh, quickly, right? Good enough, like MVP level, you roll it out and uh, you, you want to feel fast, right? You want to know whether this is actually um, align with what you expect or not. And, and the earlier you learn and the, the better you, you do, right? And then you quickly pivot and you try a different direction. Um, so don't, don't, don't be afraid of that end analysis or failures. It's so common. Actually try to do it faster and try to do it in the early stage so that well, you, can, you can learn faster. Um, so are there two questions that are related and it targets both of you, Brenda and Ting? Is that one is on PhD and masters and graduates, you know, uh, how much especially that it helps you achieve this T-shaped exposure and are you glad you continued your educa education with uh, after undergrad or do you think you could have gained something more with work experience? And then right after that, Bezawi actually, Bezawi Talam asked a similar question that what is like the mindset or maxim that do you think that you follow that help you succeed on, on, the, on the profession? Probably because they're related, maybe you can answer them together. And both of you, let's start getting for both of you. Brenda? You want me to start? Yeah, about um, doing a PhD and going on in academia for some time. I think it helped me um, have this mindset of not all problems have a solution. Not everything will uh, will be, you know, well structured and easy. There is a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of open problems. You get build on some resilience to frustration, and I think that that's uh, a good skill to have. Um, if you ask me, would I have preferred to have gotten more work experience? Probably my answer would be yes. I think I would have preferred looking back. Um, to have done a few years maybe of this, get some exposure, but then have moved to this industry a bit sooner. Uh, in hindsight, I would have liked to do this. Um, and then if you ask what kind of, um, Maxime, do you think that you follow to help you succeed? I personally, on my day-to-day -day life, I like to both ask questions, ask for help whenever I need, to my colleagues and offer help whenever I can because this will help uh, me understand things. They'll help me, um, me move faster, be more in synchrony with the rest of the team and at the same time build relationships and this is really important in the workplace. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, and Brenda is doing a great job. I mean, the the first team she's in, uh, yeah, I think everyone really appreciates <laughs> you being in the, in, the, in the team. Like it really, really helps the teams a lot. Yeah, so I, I can, uh, I, 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 will, I will talk more from a practical point of view, right? And, and give, you, <laughs> um, give you some, some like, you know, uh, very honest like view on this. So um, if, you, if you look at the, the data scientists uh, and I mean, it's a very well, very well defined term. Uh, by that, I mean like people that specialize in model building and algorithm building, this kind of roles. Um, I do see companies using PhD and master as a filter. This is not to say I agree with that. Uh, this is also not to say I think this is the right thing, but uh, the, the truth is many companies use this as a filter for the, for the uh, in the first stage, right, the application to to the to the interview phase, they do use this. Um, I do. I think the the trend is slightly changing because uh, 
the commercial companies realize that uh, there's a certain merits for people coming from academia because they right four years or maybe sometimes even more than that research enables you to go deep right because it forces you to go deep like you can't you can't publish three papers unless you really a domain expert in that so so you you, you naturally build this 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 uh, uh, again right to shift this uh, this horizontal um uh, this vertical part uh, but many of uh, the success in the commercial setting requires experience right many many phds they don't they are not exposed to large scale data sets they are not exposed to the complexity in the in the in the in the stakeholder um, side they don't get exposed to you know business usually have very ambiguous questions right and and you need to you need to connect with their their mind like how they think of of, of business goals and and what you can help them to achieve and usually commercial experience uh, uh helps a lot on this so i i don't i don't think this is a this is a definite one um but if you if you really want to uh be on the modeling side. If you don't have a degree, you can have other means to help you. Right? You you can you can uh, take courses. You can uh, um, uh, write blogs. There's many other ways you you could exhibit that you have certain expertise. Uh, but you need to look for that. Right? You 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 you, you need you need uh, uh, ways to to uh, uh, give evidence you are expert in these algorithms. It's not enough just to use certain packages and run, run a few uh, models and, and do some things on the side. But you do have other means rather than uh, a PhD degree to exhibit that. Um, if you are, look, if you are uh, uh, looking to, into more software engineering roles, uh, I would say the, the commercial experience is probably more valuable. Um, because their things are changing all the all the all the way, and many many issues, many challenges uh, in the in the software development, you can only get exposed when you work on a real problem. Like you, you, you will not expose that uh, when you just do a research problem. Um, so the other like software engineering kind of roles, I, I would argue commercial experience is more valuable. Um, so, yeah, take, take it with a grain of salt. I, I'm, I'm telling from my experience, right? Again, I, I don't necessarily always agree, like, well, we need to use PhD degree, but uh, this is, this is uh, uh, what happens uh, in the, yeah, in, 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 the, in today's company. And uh, I, I think what I totally agree with what Brenda shared, right, around what makes you successful. I, I myself um, value learnings a lot and, and this is basically drives every change of my career right so uh, this drives my big change why i want to get onto the management path uh, this I, as i shared this drove my decision to uh, move to berlin after leaving uh, 18 years in the netherlands and take on a completely different industry and and uh, a new company uh, I, I i i'm i really i, I yeah i value learning so much i if it's something that I feel I can keep learning, I, I will be satisfied. I, I, I feel like I, <laughs> I, can, I can get motivated. I will be happy every day getting up, <laughs> getting up from the bed. Um, and, and I feel like this helps my professional uh, career as well, because I just like a sponsor, right? You just want to absorb many different new things around you and you, you will be humble because you want to learn from others. And you, uh, yeah, you will be you will be listening to others' perspectives and uh, opinions. I think this 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 truly helps me a, a lot. Great! It's really awesome. Thank you so much. I think that those are the questions. Um, Olsi, did you raise your hand? Do you want the, did you want to ask something? Yes. Thank you very much, Yababel, and uh, thank you very much, Young, for your presentation. I uh, really learned a lot. I uh, have just a small question relating the business side. Uh, you have been working with uh, Booking.com or Welfare. Uh, there is some other students or people who don't want to work for others. They would like to invest for their own business, 
get partnership with companies like Booking.com. Mm -hmm. And here in Africa, there is no uh, many people who knows the Booking.com how it's work and all these things. What is your advice for the student who want to uh, get like your your license to implement the Booking.com project in in mm -hmm. Africa? Like, come over here if I would like to implement Booking.com. I know that there is already hotel and houses already hit, but like me, I know you right now. And if I want to invest in that business, what is your advice? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not an entrepreneur myself, so <laughs> I, I put much, much less thoughts into, into this. Um, but taking, taking booking as a very concrete example, um, is actually for, for any platform, right? The, the, the power of the platform is to enable a long tail. This is why booking success, this is also why Wayfair success, right? Yes, the main the main revenue, the main chunk, always coming from the the, the head, right? The head of uh, the head suppliers, a few that will contribute to to the majority of the uh, revenues. But uh, the the way that a platform is built is to enable the long tail. So taking booking as an example, right? There is um, self service like the for for the suppliers to to sign up and then put up their inventory on the platform. It's usually built in a way that it requires minimum um, account management interaction. So you don't need to talk to account manager from booking to, to go through that. And uh, it's usually provide tools that enables you to do this kind of business uh, in a relatively easy way, right? Um, and I, I, to be honest, I think that the companies that are building this part uh, at excellence is usually the company that are very successful. Uh, it, you, you can think of Facebook, Google, right? They, they all enable the very long tail small business to be able to leverage their platform uh, to find the customers and to, to, uh, to, to do their uh, best. So the same for, for Booking. So if you look at the website, there, there is place uh, for the self-service like supplier side. Um, and there's also other ways, but I, yeah, I think that that is probably the the, the easiest one to to uh, do business with with booking. Great, cool, yeah. So well, super happy to to um, join you, and I, I feel all the all the questions super <laughs> inspiring as well, and and book my mind to think of like you know <laughs> many things I I don't usually. <laughs> Think that much so yeah really really uh, happy to be with you and uh, hopefully yeah, and, and, my sharing address some of your questions and give you some thoughts food for thought it's really like i would say it was very eye-opening in many contexts and definitely some of you know the just the internal workings and the mindsets and the, you know the, the different experiences uh, that are kind of outlined here and usually we have also one person who wants to say um, thank you and anyone who is volunteer to do that just um, so if you can unmute yourself and just okay uh, the thing and brenda thank you for sharing your experience and um, the question that asked here also answered uh, like technically and then technically so it does bring some knowledge and it's uh, come it's kind of eye-opening for us and i'm glad i see uh women's on this uh you know this technology team like here also there is uh, a small team of women and that is uh, something i'm so glad about and thank you for sharing your experiences yeah Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, no, I have nothing else to add. Thank you, everyone. That's I don't want to after after the talk about uh, women in science. I don't want to be the man who comes in and tries to mansplain everything and <laughs> and have the last word. I'll just say thank you, um, thank you, Ting and Brenda, and looking forward to. Uh, we're look we're really looking to build partnerships with different companies, both on the on the challenge side but also learning where industry is going where it's coming from i think this idea of t-shaped is is very important we thought about it years ago and we've forgotten 
um, but you've put some words to what we've uh, what we're trying to do. So yeah, um, hopefully it was also interesting for you. And if there's any other ways that we can provide some value to Wayfair um, other than buying chairs, please don't hesitate to let us know. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the wisdom uh, that's shared. So I really want to say thank you, team, uh, for having the time and extending even more than the plan. So um, really, really thank you. And I thank you also, Brenda, for helping organizing this. And we yeah. really appreciate that. So Indeed. thanks a lot. Thanks, Brenda. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Have a good evening. Use that. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.